Welcome to another episode of the All Turtles podcast, a show about entrepreneurship and AI. I'm John C. Fuentes, co-founder at All Turtles. Today, Phil Libin and I interview Julian Guthrie. Julian is a former journalist at the San Francisco Chronicle and a New York Times bestselling author. Her new book, Alpha Girls, follows the stories of four women who became successful VCs in a Silicon Valley culture where women were often not only excluded from the room, but actively discouraged. She shares some of the lessons learned from the women's extraordinary accomplishments and how VCs and entrepreneurs can apply them today. Then, Jessica Collier joins Phil and I for another I Roll Please segment and a listener question. So we're so happy to welcome Julian Guthrie, a longtime writer at the San Francisco Chronicle. Formerly. Formerly writer at the San Francisco Chronicle, author of multiple New York Times bestselling books, including How to Make a Spaceship, uh, The Billionaire and the Mechanic, and what we'll be talking about mostly today, which is Alpha Girls, uh, which profiles the lives of four really amazing women in this male-dominated industry of high-growth tech investing. So Julian, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. You said that the inspiration for Alpha Girls came from your book tour on how to make a spaceship, where you met all these engineers and designers and product people and scientists, and we're wondering where all the ladies were in the room. So can you talk about that experience a little bit? That's and just true. How it propelled you into this book? Well, it's strange that, so I was a journalist at the San Francisco Chronicle for 20 years, and so I wasn't oblivious to this issue of you know, the the paucity of women in tech, but it really was when I was on tour for How to Make a Spaceship, and I was spending a lot of time with this, the main character of the book, Peter Diamandis, a larger-than-life figure, founder of the XPRIZE. And so we were talking to um, engineers, entrepreneurs, uh, rocket scientists, you know, aerospace geeks, and there'd be, say, a crowd of a thousand, and I would see maybe 10 women. And that was really consistent where I just began to think, as you said in the lead-in, where are all the women? And so I came back from that tour, and I live in the Bay Area, and I started to think about women's stories and where women are underrepresented, where in, in an industry in particular that has outsized influence. So I started to zero in on venture capital as a really fascinating um focused area. And I started to look at the numbers and I saw that 90, then 94% of all investing partners at VC firms were men. And which made me think, okay, well, there are some women who are there and clearly some who have been successful. So I then started zeroing in on finding those women who were there, who are there, who have succeeded. And I cast a wide net at first to find them, um, interviewing a ton of women and then and then kind of winnowing down that list. And what were you looking for to get down to the particular four women that you write about in your book? I really was looking for women who had who had financed and helped build uh, in their role as VCs, industries or companies companies in particular where they were the lead, where they were huge successes, the the companies, and the wins, if you will, were irrefutably theirs. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some cases where there were game-changing industries that came out of these. And I was looking for women of different generations and very different paths so that there would be Almost like, um, this may sound like a weird analogy, but like Sex in the City where, you know, women or men, women can watch that show and you relate to one character over the other. You know, like, oh, I'm very, you know, very Carrie Bradshaw or I'm... So I wanted That's women... such a Samantha thing to say. It, it, yeah, it is exactly. <laughs> but I For wanted... Have no idea yes, what I there, you're talking about. Is, um, so I started to think of the women in terms of, you know, very different personalities, very different backstories. Um, two are, you know, our first generation immigrants, one from Turkey, one um, uh, daughter of uh, Chinese American immigrants, and one woman who is from the South, and one woman who is from the Midwest. West, and they all came to California to, you know, really to Sand Hill Road, to Silicon Valley, to find their dreams. And they had no idea when they begin, like we do in life, right? 
you know, what is ahead of them. And they had no idea of the challenges. And then the walls that would go up around them just for being women. So it's a very, you know, the the narrative, I write in a very novelistic way. So you learn about, you know, their their backstories, their family lives, their hopes, their dreams, their dreams dashed. It becomes very personal while it is also this look inside the world of venture capital and this ecosystem of VC and, and tech, which you all know very well. It's hard for me to care very much about VCs just because like as an industry is just kind of lame. Like why did you choose venture capital as the, the industry to really look at for these, for these stories of uh, inspiring and powerful women? So I think that it's an important point and I completely defend my choice. And that is, I think that if venture capital doesn't diversify, that tech won't diversify. I think it's Double almost... click on that. Like, why do you think that is... Like, I think it's like the start of the food chain. I'm not sure that's the best descriptive, but mm-hmm. I think if you don't have women who are actually writing the checks, mm-hmm. um, you won't have the same level of funding of women founders. Mm-hmm. Um, so it creates this very much of a domino effect where you don't have women writing the checks. You have, you know, 2% of all VC dollars going to, you know, women founded firms. Yeah. So then, um, you know, men are funding men and the male, um, the men who are doing the startups later on, maybe they're being acquired by a bigger company that's largely comprised of men. Mm-hmm. And so it perpetuates the sameness. Yeah. And so it's really key that venture in particular um, diversifies and that women get to the point where they are writing the checks. Yeah. So they're investing partners, they're managing directors, they're in the places of, of decision making. In all of my experience with VCs, it has been horribly gender segregated. I totally agree. In fact, it was like the weirdest thing for me as being in the VC industry was it was the first time in my life where... I would sit in multiple meetings with just like a dozen dudes and no women. Like that's never happened before. Like this doesn't happen in almost any other industry that we participate in. Even in tech companies, you don't, you won't have a dozen, you know, guys in a room without any women. But with VCs, it's been pretty common. So right now, uh, one of the main characters in my book, I say character, but they're real people. Uh, but they are characters. <laughs> they're characters true. Yeah. They're definitely characters. So I can tell you stories. Um, Teresa Gao, you mm-hmm. know, she's now investing um, her the firm that she co-founded with Jennifer Fonstad, Aspect mm-hmm. Ventures, I think that their rate of investments in women-founded firms is at around 43%. Wow. So Sonia Perkins is another uh, primary figure of my book. She was with Menlo Ventures for mm-hmm. almost 20 years. Now she runs an all-women's investment platform called Broadway Angels, which is an incredible yeah. uh, collection of astounding women. And their rate of investing in women founders is 50%, close to 50%. Right. So you look at just these two cases, and we could go on, you know, with other, um, now there's a focus, there's a focus on this. So there's an awareness of, um, let's, let's be welcoming to women founders. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's look for them. But of course, they have to be great entrepreneurs and have a great concept. Right. So I think it's bringing awareness to it all around, you know, from the founder side and from the funder side. You know, I've been in pitch meetings where during the reporting of this book, where at, say, Broadway Angels, where mm-hmm. it's all women around the table. Yeah. You know, it's a shocking scene for, <laughs> for venture capitalists. Yeah. You know, a long conference table and 30 women and entrepreneurs come in to pitch and maybe they haven't done their homework to know exactly who they're pitching to sure. because they're in shock to see all women. Right. But my point is that so often, I mean, even in pitch sessions that I sh- that I saw where it was all women there, where you have a male and a female as co-founders, the co the male in from what I saw, uh, he would take the tech questions, yeah, and even if the female co-founder was the tech lead or was the engineer, so there are all sorts of things that where it's there's this implicit bias. Yeah. That we all have, we're humans, we're all biased, but just talking about it and bringing awareness around it yeah. and telling these stories of women who got into the tech industry to do one thing and 
you know, figured out ways to succeed, really fascinating ways that I tell in my book, Alpha Girls, and then were broadsided in a couple of cases in also unexpected ways, not this overt sexual harassment type that that is said to be very pervasive in the Valley, but in different ways that that speak more to a deeper bias. And then why did they stay in? And what is it that they love about this industry? And why is it important? You know, so it gets into all of that. I've, I've, it's been very interesting for me to see how women figure out how to succeed in male dominated industries. Yeah. I think the implicit bias is, it definitely feels like that's true. A friend of mine, uh, actually a great, a great woman CEO that we've had on this podcast, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Katarina Holtz, uh, she runs a, an AI company that's doing Parkinson's uh, cures, uh, really super impressive. And uh, uh, she said to me, you know, we've been friends for a while and she said to me last year or something, as she was raising money, uh, she said, uh, you know, I just noticed that like, I just have better meetings if I'm wearing pants. And I said, you know, me too. Um, and so like the best I could do was like make a dumb joke out of it. Uh-huh. But it's like, it's actually a, a total, it, it rang totally true. Like it rang totally true as like a true and sad statement that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's the case. That is the case. And, and, you know, women, you know, one of the, again, and going back to my book, you know, MJ Elmore, uh, she was very successful at IVP, but she realized early on as a young woman, she walked in wearing, you know, a dress yeah. and she would get a comment. Oh, you look so, you know, you look so, I love that dress, you know, mm-hmm. and it was probably innocent, but it would distract. You wouldn't say the same thing to a guy. You wouldn't say, oh, you know, great blue T-shirt you've got on today, you know. Thank you. So it became, it, yes, it, but it became a distraction. So she did the same thing of kind of toning down. She didn't want it to be a distraction. Yeah. So there are layers and layers like that that I found where it's something that maybe you're not even thinking about that women are um, strategizing over, Mm -hmm. you know, the how to be heard, the what to wear, the um, allies that you have. I mean, an important part of, you know, the success of um, a couple of these women in my book is they had really strong male allies. You know, the guys are not, um, not the bad guys. Um, There are good guys and there are bad guys, the same for women. But when women in male-dominated industries have a male ally or two, that's really, um, really helpful. If someone who will tell them, like, the locker room talk, what the other guys are saying, who will defer to them in meetings and kind of set a tone uh, when all the questions, you know, go to uh, the man in the meeting maybe— you know, and and maybe let's say Teresa, you know, who's an expert in cybersecurity, Teresa Gao, mm-hmm. but the, she's not getting the questions, yeah. you know, but then her male ally will just be like, you know, Teresa is really the one you should be asking. Yeah. So there's a role that um, that men can play, which is super important as well. It's a big part of this whole equation. Do you have any tips for like for male VCs about how to how to do this correctly? How to like ask questions correctly, how to think about pitch meetings, like how do you, how do you, how should people who want to deal with their implicit bias actually, actually do it? Well, and women have that too. I mean, there are studies out that women are more prone to um, invest in male entrepreneurs and, and then even further than that, good looking male entrepreneurs. So, and the same for men. So we all have to think about you know, the decisions that we're making and look at the decisions we're making. And when it comes to investing, uh, really be aware of that, but also be aware of, um, you know, who has the expertise, not making assumptions. You know, women of my book who, you know, had their, you know, master's degrees, had worked at Bain, had worked at a startup, had, you know, gone through the ranks of a VC firm, you know, were still stopped and asked for coffee or, you know, the time, what time the meeting started. So just think about these things, you know, and don't make these assumptions. Yeah. And, you know, really, I mean, they're just, you know, the women, women as a part of this equation are really, really key. Yeah. And it's a vicious cycle too, because as a VC, you have to, back when I was a VC, this was one of the main things that people kept telling me I had to do better, is you have to think about how the person you're investing in is going to be able to raise additional rounds, especially as an early stage thing. So it kind of, it, it, it has a multiplicative effect. Like even if you, even if you're trying to deal with implicit bias, you're still evaluating people based on how f- other investors will evaluate them in the future. So the, the implicit bias kind of multiplies. It's, uh, 
a difficult thing to, to force yourself to get out of. It really does. I don't know. I'd be interested in your, you know, uh, tips on this too. Like what, what, what are you thinking of? How are you thinking of this subject differently? Well, we explicitly just try to work with as many women founders and entrepreneurs and engineers as possible. So we, we, we're not doing as good a job as we can be, but I think part of it is like, it has to feel the way I think about it myself is I have to feel that I am trying unfairly hard. Like it has to feel, it has to feel unfair to me that we have to try this hard because if I don't feel at least a little bit of resentment, like my God, why am I actually trying it this hard? Like if I don't feel that resentment, I'm not doing enough because otherwise you just don't do enough because I have the same implicit bias as everyone else. And just being aware of it doesn't make it go away. So we just, we just try harder in lots of, you know, lots of ways. Um, and hopefully we'll get, you know, hopefully we'll get better and better at it, but ultimately because it leads to better results, right? Because if you're not taking advantage of all of the amazing things that half of the population can do, then you're really, you know, only having half the impact that you can have. Right. And women, we all know, drive consumer purchases, consumer spending uh, globally. So if you're not uh, mm. looking at that voice, at that presence, as that, yeah. at that uh, perspective, you know, it's a huge miss approaching what actual representation would look like, I think, across the board. Mm -hmm. Getting closer to that, at least. I mean, there's only um, progress to be made. Julian, so you've been writing about Silicon Valley for a long time. Was there a moment or moments in researching these four women that actively surprised you, maybe for the positive rather than uh, the assumptions that we could find uh, regarding a male-dominated industry? Well, it was very interesting for me to do this book on women because my last two books have been driven by men and mm -hmm. kind of these titans of industry. Larry Ellison, I spent a year interviewing Larry. Um, and then my last book, How to Make a Spaceship, you know, where I interviewed Peter Diamandis and Elon Musk and Richard Branson. And so it was really fascinating for me and actually a great privilege just in terms of expanding my mind spending so much time with these women who figured out how to succeed. I learned a couple of things stand out real quickly. I, I learned how, again, women in a male-dominated industry can succeed and that people can indeed increment their way to success, um, that there are these, and that resistance can take many forms. It was fascinating to see, again, how they skillfully navigated um, a lot of obstacles and were able to continue on their path. So it redefined my sense of how people succeed, for one, because I'd spent time with, you know, the Larry Ellison's of the world and where they are not compromising, where they are not backing down, where they are not capitulating on things. And, and so that's one model. But I think that's more for the, like, Point zero 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 one percent um whereas this model of success that you find in alpha girls is much more applicable to most of our lives the second thing that was fascinating again speaking of the contrast to generalize but this has been my experience with the the men i've interviewed um you know some of the greatest success stories of of the world really and the women the women were much more hesitant to reveal their flaws and reveal their shortcomings and reveal the difficulties in their lives and I had to work so hard to tell a story that was honest and textured and that had um, the missteps and the regrets. And so it was very, very difficult to get the women to do that. And I realized why after stepping back from, you know, finishing the book, um, that it's because these women work so hard to wear these Teflon suits, to be unflappable, to be strong at all times, that letting down their guard, you know, is something they just weren't accustomed to doing. So th that those were two really key things. Again, redefining how we succeed and really this issue around women and their own sense of needing to kind of cling to perfection and being unflappable, which which is not a good way to go at times, right. which proved the case in, in, in these women's lives. But so that was really interesting to me. So Julian, what's the VC landscape look like into the future? How long is it going to take for us to see more gender parity in women entrepreneurs and investors? 
you see really positive things going on, um, as I cited with Broadway Angels, with the the amazing group called All Rays, which is doing impressive work, um, bringing more diversity into venture capital. Um, I think the more you see, you have these phenotypes, you have these, this, you know, the women who have succeeded. So you have the women of my book who you can follow their paths and you have role models. So there's this saying, you can't be what you can't see. And so the world needs to see more of these women who are successful entre- entrepreneurs, engineers, VCs. And not only that, but they love the industry. They love being a part of of um, of technology, the technology of the future, and playing a role, whether you're financing that or whether you're building that or whether you're mentoring that. Um, so I think, I think there are a lot of positive things going on. However, the latest statistics that I saw um, around VCs in particular were – that now something like 92% instead of 94% when I started my reporting of all venture partners um, are men. So it's a gain, you know, it's an incremental gain, but it is going in the right direction. And again, it's it's like the dialogue we're having. It's, it's talking about it. It's an awareness around it. So um, I think there, there's hope and I think there's a ton of work to go. Well, I guess incremental gain and, you know, no backseas sustained over a number of years is, is what all of this stuff takes. So No backseas. I yeah, like that. Hopefully we'll, hopefully we'll get there. Yes. Julian, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for coming in. Now it's time for an eye roll, please segment in which we take our oft repeated Silicon Valley advice and turn it on its head. And I think in this one, we're going to talk about ignoring the haters. Jessica, Hmm. tell us what's happening with Spot. Oh, well, there's nothing in particular that's happening with Spot. I think I'm just particularly adept at some ways and not at all adept in others at ignoring the haters. (laughs) Um, Do you say more? uh, Well, I think Maria and I talked about this like pretty extensively on a recent podcast episode of uh, the startup playbook. Um, But I get a lot of it's not I I wouldn't call them haters. It's more like well-intentioned, well-intentioned, like super misguided, very entitled feedback is how I would put it. And it usually is like it's usually from people who um think that the world is becoming too PC or that like the real problem with harassment and discrimination is that people are going to make up incidents of harassment and discrimination, right? Like so-called false reporting, um, rather than that the problem is that 75 to 90 percent of harassment and discrimination that actually happens goes unreported. Um, and so their constructive feedback is more on the product as a whole in the space and not necessarily specific it's features. It's on the or, broader issue, yeah. right? It's on the broader like sort of public issue. Um, And I've learned that you can't ignore them because um, they're everywhere. (laughs) But you can figure out like constructive ways to try to take them from asking all of the wrong questions to actually thinking about the right questions, which I think is my new tactic. My new tactic is also not to lose my temper. Yeah, Um, scrubbing out (laughs) the kind of emotional context. It's so hard, though. (laughs) It's so hard. But I mean, I think I think you're right. I don't think like the issue is not to ignore people; it's to take the useful part of what they're saying and like not be impacted by the not useful part. And you know, there's there's usually useful stuff even in stupid criticism. Mm, I mean, for this particular thing that I'm thinking of, it's less. There's like less useful stuff in there than than it's just interesting to see how common that fixation on the particular question, like what I consider to be the wrong question of false reporting is. And like that, that in itself is the useful thing, right? Like knowing that like, okay, that's where a lot of people's minds are going to be. Okay. How do we, how do we deal with that? Yeah. Uh, uh, And you know, people, I think are a lot of, a lot of times people are motivated to say the negative thing just because that makes you feel smarter. So like (laughs) pointing out like the hypothetical problem, even if it's the wrong problem, it's it's just like a common thing. Um, It's just way easier. It's easier. It makes you feel contrarian and it kind of makes you feel smart. Like I probably do it all the time. No. Uh, <laughs> what about ism? Um, well, all of this stuff, right? Like it doesn't, it may or may not mean that people are really attached to that position or not, but it's, it's useful to see like what are the, 
yeah, where, where, what are people wrong about? Where is their heads at? Because you do have to figure out how to, mm -hmm. at some point, coexist in a world where your product lives with these people. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so what do we want to say about this, uh, about ignore the haters in general? It's kind of half true. Mm, I don't, I mean, I think anyone who says you can ignore them is probably living in a pretty nice place. I don't think, I think ignoring that, like telling you to ignore them is like, it is ignoring the, re that advice in itself is like ignoring the reality that is for most people, um, like it is ignoring the reality that like a lot of people will feel entitled to come up to you and give you lots of feedback yeah. about the thing that you're working on, <laughs> even when it's even when you haven't solicited it. It's probably safe to ignore the trolls, especially when they're kind of faceless on social media. Like there are mm -hmm. people who are just trying to troll you and that's not particularly useful. But I think anyone who's actually going to bother like giving you what feels like polite feedback, even if it's wrongheaded, like in person and not anonymously, it's like that, that's not a troll. That's probably just someone who's wrong. So it's at least useful to understand how common that wrongness is. Mm -hmm. So now we'll take a listener question. And this question comes in from Niels on Twitter. And Niels says, why did you pick Paris over London or Berlin? And Niels is referencing our, uh, our current office locations in San Francisco, Paris, and Tokyo. Well, we do actually have a small office in Berlin. Um, we have a team of three people working there who are part of the spot team. I really like Berlin. I think it's, um, it is definitely the, what do you, what would you call it? The less annoying San Francisco of Western Europe. <laughs> yeah. Like basically <laughs> the stuff I like about San Francisco is in Berlin and the stuff I hate about San Francisco is not in Berlin. So it's <laughs> yes. just, Berlin is just better than San Francisco. <laughs> At least for now. Yeah. Yeah. But we, yeah, we have people, we actually have people in London yeah, too. Exactly. Uh, oh, that's right. We yeah. have people in we Amsterdam. Do. Um, I think we picked, quote unquote, you can't see the air quotes they're making, but they're, they're dramatic, uh, Paris over, over the other ones because we wanted to say like what our, what our European hub was. And um, yeah, it may just be the wrong framing. We're actually in a bunch of cities in Europe and we're, we're looking to add people kind of all over the place. So mm -hmm. It's convenient that San Francisco, Paris, and Tokyo are kind of longitudinally evenly distributed all over the world too. Are they? I didn't even notice that. Yeah. <laughs> huh. I guess that's true. Yeah, but in Europe, we need to, like Tokyo, we, we're, we're growing really quickly and we have a bunch of projects. Uh, we, we probably have more people in Europe. We definitely have more people in Europe outside of Paris than in Paris. So mm -hmm. we should probably just talk about that, you know, differently. But right. we do have a really beautiful office and a great team in, uh, in Paris. Yeah, and I think, uh, Phil, your typical answer for this is that we picked Paris because the food is really good. <laughs> yeah, the food's good. Oh, it's good in Berlin, too. Yeah. Um, mm. <laughs> Curry, curry worst. Curry worst. Yeah. Ew. Yeah. It's so yeah. good. Yeah. What you, you like your team got me a big oh. bottle of curry worst ketchup last oh. time you guys came over. Oh, I know. It's delicious. I'm not a fan of this <laughs> line of gift giving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in general, I think there's a there's a lot of potential in a lot of the European cities. A uh, big part of what we're trying to do at Old Hurdles is to kind of expand that that in VC terms, the TAM, the total addressable market, of who gets to be an entrepreneur. Uh, beyond people who would normally get to be entrepreneurs who want to like join startups in Silicon Valley to all sorts of other people. And there's a lot of brilliant people in uh, uh, many of the European cities that normally just don't get to be entrepreneurs. And we hope to be able to work with them to make high impact stuff. Cool. Thanks for the question, Niels. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode in the world-class Donatello Studios in San Francisco, California. Big thanks to Julian Guthrie for joining us this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email at hello at all-turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy-Thompson for producing, Chris Plug for his audio expertise, Micah Rivera for our artwork, and Matt Ammerman for our theme music. On behalf of Jessica Collier, Phil Libin, and yours truly, John Cifuentes, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>